Hello, friends and neighbors. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Chris Segrin from the University of Arizona Department of Communication. And as you can see from this slide, our topic today is going to be conflict de-escalation tactics. What we're going to talk about today is how you turn down the heat when you find yourself in an interpersonal interaction with someone who's a little hot and bothered and things are getting a little out of control and you want to turn it down. That's called conflict de-escalation. We won't talk about how to win an argument. We're going to have a companion video on conflict negotiation tactics that will get much more explicitly into how you negotiate yourself through a conflict and find outcomes that work for both of you. Today is really about what can I do to bring it down when things are getting out of control. So what we'll talk about specifically today is the nature of human conflict briefly, the arc of conflict, and when do you intervene to turn it down. Useful tools for that, the low line method, a technique used in mental health nursing, and then some recommendations and contraindications for tactics for de-escalation. Before we begin, it's important to understand a few things about your own interaction with the people in your world and your own safety. And first and foremost, your safety and the safety of others is the highest priority. So always use good judgment, maintain you know, a safe distance, uh, avoid being alone with an individual who's combative or potentially violent. Uh, if there's a risk of violence, you know, move yourself out of the situation to seek safety. Obviously, know your own limits. Keep in mind that some people are gonna be much better at implementing some of these tactics than others. Some of them take some practice and some experience. You may not be comfortable using them with all, in, all people, so know where your own limits and comfort zone is. And always remember the third bullet point is it's okay to obtain help. A lot of times when you're in a situation and it's escalating out of control, your best bet might be to seek help from someone, whether it's a security staff or law enforcement, and get yourself to a safe location. Always remember these points when dealing with any conflict with human beings who can sometimes be unpredictable. Here's a quote from James Burton in a book called Violence Explained. Burton says, the conclusion to which we are coming is that seemingly different and separate social problems from street violence to industrial frictions to ethnic and international conflicts are symptoms of the same cause, and that is institutional denial of needs of recognition and identity, and the sense of security when they are satisfied despite losses through violent conflict. I highlighted recognition and identity. At the core of so many human conflicts is a violation of that or a failure to satisfy that need for recognition and identity. And if you know that and you remember that, it will actually give you some advantage when trying to de-escalate conflict. Remember, deep down inside, what the person is probably looking for is recognition and some respect for their identity. It may be manifest in some trivial, seemingly trivial, like you gave me a B instead of an A or a, you know, a paper, and why are we arguing about this? But at the core of that is recognition and identity very often. The arc of conflict uh, in healthcare settings, we, we train uh, psychiatric nurses to think about conflict and the potential for explosive, dangerous conflict as having a sort of arc that begins with disagreement. And during the disagreement phase, one can use conflict management skills to intervene and try to alter them. We're gonna have a companion video available if you're interested in this topic on negotiating through conflicts that will deal with some of those conflict management skills that you might wanna check out as well. Then we have agitation and aggression. If conflict keeps building, agitation and aggression is the next phase where the, the party you're dealing with is getting angry, getting frustrated, showing nonverbal signs of agitation. This is the state where conflict de-escalation skills come into place. If they're not successful, then what often results is physical violence. And in an institutional setting, restraint, whether it's physical or pharmacological restraint, is the only option at that point. The idea when training people who work with people who have a propensity for explosive physical behavior is to not have to get to that point where physical restraint is, is needed. So what we're talking about today 
is when we're in this agitation and aggression phase. So there's been disagreement, there's been some discussion, some negotiation, it's getting out of control, right? We're not getting a resolution, and now the person is acting truly agitated and showing signs of aggression. And now, our goal is no longer to win the argument. Our goal is to tone it down. Let's get some peace and quiet, some calm going on here, all right, for everybody's safety, everybody's well-being. That's when and where conflict de-escalation tactics come in and are, are very worthwhile. If you're already in a state of physical violence, you've passed that stage in the arc where these are gonna be effective. So this is to try to prevent that from happening. What are some tools that you can bring to conflict encounters that will help you to be able to de-escalate conflict? Well, first, let's start with emotional fitness. This is a day-to-day -day thing in your everyday life. Know what you can control. Understand that you cannot control what happens in the environment, but you can control how you respond to it. So when you're confronted with a difficult person, the first step is not to control their behavior. The first step is to control your behavior. That's part of emotional fitness. Be ready for that. We cannot control the behavior of others, but we can control our behavior. And if we're gonna effectively de-escalate, we have to have our behavior under control, first and foremost. Prepare to manage your anger. So be prepared for what's gonna happen during this episode. Uh, provocation, right? This might upset me, but I know how to deal with it. Uh, impact and confrontation. What difference will this whole episode make a month from now? Sometimes we get caught up in the moment and we bicker over things that are really inconsequential. Sometimes we need to know, and part of emotional fitness and preparation for anger is knowing when to let things go. Coping with anger. Um, if you feel your muscles getting tense right now, your heart beating really hard, uh, that's a sign that, okay, I need to take a deep breath, do a little self-relaxation, keep myself calm, self-soothing, very, very important. And then after a confrontation, reflecting back on how could I have handled this better? What did I learn from this? What could I have done differently? That's an iterative process. And if we do that when we get in conflict situations and we're trying to de-escalate and we're trying to control our own anger and we reflect on these episodes, we'll be better able to handle that and to perform that the next time around. Other tools, perspective. Having a perspective on conflicts with other people and what we can actually do to manage those conflicts. You know, in mental health care settings, research shows that the younger and less experienced staff have the greatest risk for being assaulted. And it's thought that the reason for that is that they have unrealistic confidence in their personal skills. Like, I can walk into this situation and I'll get everything settled down. Sometimes the most adept and skilled conflict de-escalators are people who go, I may not be able to handle this. They may have doubts about that. Doubt can actually be healthy sometimes because overconfidence can lead people into situations that are dangerous, that they can't control, but they think they can control, and that's a formula for disaster. So having doubt sometimes promotes caution and an easy technique of trying out some tactics without going in heavy-handed. De-escalation works best when it's done early in intervention. Okay, so there's a point in a conflict where we have to, I'm, I'm gonna repeat this several times today, but it's an important point, where we have to switch off the I wanna win the argument and switch on the I wanna tone down the conversation. Now that's the new goal. I'm no longer concerned with winning this argument. I just want this to get toned down a little bit. All of that comes from perspective. Time is a great ally in conflict de-escalations. One of the main sub-goals in conflict de-escalation is to buy yourself time. Uh, when people get aggressive in, in interpersonal communication, they start accusations, they start shouting, they start name calling, and this starts rolling out very, very quickly, very quickly. Emotional arousal triggers quick responses. A lot of times people will feel under pressure to respond to others quickly Otherwise, it'll make it appear like I'm giving in or I've lost the argument. So I'll feel like as soon as you say something, I gotta say something in response. Why is that? There's no rule that says that. 
You can take a deep breath and pause for a moment, collect your thoughts. It's not a contest. Remember, you're not, when you're trying to de-escalate con conflict, you're not trying to win a fight. So slow it down a little bit and let time work to your advantage. Time pressure to quickly respond leads to compromised information processing. And then the compromised information processing is the father of all bad decisions, basically. You don't want that. You want to be thinking through, if I say this or if I do this, what will happen next? Or if I don't do this or I don't say this, what might happen next? You, ha you need to give yourself the time to process what's going on in a very heated, very dynamic situation. And the best thing you can do is see if you can slow it down. And I'll tell you something, too. There's a interesting phenomenon in human communication whereby when one person slows down their speech or one person lowers their speech volume, you know what happens? Usually their partner does the same thing. We call it an interactive phenomenon. You can actually slow down somebody else's speech by slowing down your own speech. We, we kind of try to match each other very often. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens very often. So again, you can actually potentially have some influence, a desirable one, on the other person's behavior by slowing it down for yourself and then hopefully they will follow suit and they'll slow it down as well, okay? You wanna be able also to see the situation through the other person's eyes. <clears throat> Conflict de-escalation is most effective when the person enacting it is a good perspective taker. So I'm trying to understand my partner's goals, needs, frustrations, what's making that person angry. It's not about me, it's about them. Conflict de-escalation is not about myself, it's about the other person and trying to bring this down uh, to a, a manageable level where it doesn't escalate into, say, physical violence. So the goal of uh, physical expre of expression and de-escalation is to give the distressed opponent a feeling of comfort a feeling of safety. Okay, I'm not your enemy. I'm your ally. So let's tone it down a little bit. Let me see if I can help you, right? That's the idea. I, I am not your enemy. So there's no reason to direct your anger toward me. And in fact, I wanna help you. I wanna see if we can figure out what's making you so agitated today. And let's talk about that. And I wanna listen to you. I wanna hear what you have to say. I'm gonna validate your thoughts, your feelings, and let's see if we can work on this together. That's the kind of atmosphere you wanna create for the person so that they don't view you as someone who's gonna thwart their goals, but rather someone who's gonna facilitate their goals, okay? You probably know when someone's being, uh, their, their agitation is bubbling up, but if you care to review, here are some uh, indicators, rapid speech, high-pitched voice, pacing, fidgeting, bald fists, and of course the human facial expressions, which most of us recognize, uh, the one that you are gonna be most on the lookout for when there's a real need for de-escalation tactics is the anger expression, right? The anger expression, where someone's brows are brought down and their lips are pressed together. And of course that comes a lot of times with fast paced speech and higher pitched voice. And you can see in their face that there's a lot of emotion building. And that can be a really important sign to shift from arguing with somebody and trying to make your point with them to saying, maybe I better stop doing that and now try to de-escalate, right? I'm gonna flip that switch. Let's talk about the low line method. This is taught in, again, psychiatric nursing and it's a very interesting technique. Low line, basically references listen, offer, wait, look, incline, nod, and express. Honestly, you don't have to do those in that particular order. The acronym just summarizes a number of useful tactics for de-escalation. In the heat of the moment, it's gonna be virtually impossible for anybody to remember a low line, and especially given that um, it has two L's in it, and which is look and which is the time to listen. These are all good things to do all the time when trying to de-escalate conflict. So don't get worried or hung up on trying to do them in any particular order. But let's unpack these techniques and explain how and why they can work. First, listening. We all know that 
one of the beginning stages of trying to calm another person down, especially if they're agitated and they're irritated about something, is to actively listen to them. So try to get them to talk and use open-ended questions. So like, hey, what's going on today? Right, that throws the door wide open for them to start explaining to you what's on their mind. And that's the goal, it's to get them to talk. Provide encouragement. Well, I don't really get that. Tell me more about that. You know, so I'm pulling for more uh, information from the person I'm working with. Occasionally paraphrase a statement. So it sounds like he never showed up then. Is that what you're saying? I'm checking my understanding of what I'm hearing from you, and I'm repeating it back to you. And that, that lets you know that I'm listening very carefully. Um, reflection of, on, on feelings. So, geez, that must be a real drag that they never showed up. So you're, you're kind of validating uh, a, a, the person and you're making them feel understood. Yeah, exactly, I'm, I'm irritated because the person never showed up and that's it. And then summarizing, boy, that must make you feel like uh, you're just really being you know, left out or something like that. So you're, you're making some conclusion that's very much in line with what the person's trying to convince you of. Notice how in active listening, you are, hence the term active, you are participating. You're not sitting there silently. You're actually making utterances, but the utterances are geared to let the person know, I hear you, I understand you, and even I agree with you. Now, there are times in life where you may not truly agree with them, but if what's waiting on the other side is a potential threat of physical violence, it doesn't matter if you agree with them or not. There are just times where the goal is to turn it down and to get some calm so that we can go back to having a conversation, okay? So active listening is all about that. And it does involve sometimes having to express some understanding or disagreement with someone when you may not actually feel that way. That's okay, that happens in life sometimes and that's why we need to know when it's time to de-escalate. Let me unpack a little bit more on empathic listening, active empathic listening. What we're trying to do is enhance the person's self-esteem. This goes back to something we were talking about earlier about we want recognition. We want our identity validated by others. So the effective conflict de-escalator knows how to support that person's self-esteem and be non-judgmental and non-critical when arguing with them. That can be a tough chore if you yourself are angry. So again, you gotta come into this interaction controlling your own anger. Listen for the content and the meaning. Respond honestly. Uh, paraphrase the message as we talked about. D don't interrupt, give them a chance to talk. When you're engaging in conflict de-escalation, this is not a good time to give advice. I know so many of us, when we hear someone with a problem, we think, hey, there's a simple solution. You should just do this. That, that's, that's back for conflict engagement and, and when you're trying to talk to somebody and maybe disagreeing and looking at different ways of doing things and it hasn't gotten heated, maybe then you can offer advice. But when you're really trying to engage in de-escalation, this is not a time to offer advice. Uh, do not discount their feelings. Their feelings may seem strange to you, they may seem invalid, they may seem unnecessary. That Take it as it comes. Take the pe person as he or she presents to you and accept their emotions and their feelings as they are and validate them. That's very important. If you can express some interest in their opinion, like I see what you mean, or I'd like to hear more about that. It's a great technique to get them talking and to also start to see you as an ally, right? There's no reason to aggress against somebody who's actually presenting themselves to you as a potential ally or a problem solver. And that's where you wanna position yourself psychologically in that person's mental landscape, if at all possible. In the case of uh, complaints or verbal attacks, you should try to diffuse those strong sentiments as best you can and, and get, you know, listen so that they can express themselves, but certainly do not try to fan those flames. Um, try to, validate and say, I can understand why you feel that way, but, and then try to go on to something that is going to be constructive in terms of helping them with their goal, helping them at least see you as someone who understands where they're coming from as, a, again, maybe a potential ally. The offer technique, offer the angry person the opportunity to vent. You got something on your mind? I'm here to listen. 
Acknowledge their anger, uh, li listen to their concerns. Here again, this is not the moment to try to contradict them or argue. When you're in conflict de-escalation mode, you're not arguing with somebody. You're not trying to prove a point. What you're trying to do is get along and try to make that person feel that they're in a non-judgmental and a fairly safe context, as safe as it can be given their prior behavior, um, where you are not the barrier to their goals. You're not the, the entity that's frustrating their goals. Uh, in fact, you're here to support their recognition and, and identity needs. So you can say, for example, I can see that you're angry. Will you help me let you, I'm sorry, will you let me help you with your concerns? Now that's a very non-threatening presentation. Will you let me help you with your concerns? The worst they can say is no, but they've got to think this person seems like they're here to be an ally in some way, or at a minimum, they're certainly not my enemy. I want to work with you. Please tell me what's upsetting you. Here again, a statement like that presents yourself to the other person as someone who they can unload on, so to speak. They can vent with. Okay. So these are some techniques, and down here there's some tips on what you avoid promising, uh, unachievable situations, of course. Try to give ranges of, of choices. Choice is such a great thing for human beings. Whenever you can say, well, one thing might be this, and another might be that, or maybe we could look at it this way, let them choose, let them feel like they have some control. And then explaining what will be done and when. I might wanna follow up, let me see if I can help you with that, or maybe I could go talk to somebody for you. And then comment to a, a realistic, or commit rather, to a realistic time frame, um, something that you might agree as a course of action if you're having good luck with the de-escalation techniques. Like, well, tomorrow I'll see so-and-so and I could talk to them about that for you if you'd like. How does that sound? Wait. Remember we talked earlier about the value of time when you're in de-escalation mode. Give them time to respond. Don't press things, don't try to get this resolved immediately. Conflict de-escalation is not something to do when you're in a rush. It's, it's something you do when you have time to put into it. And if it's a dangerous situation, I highly recommend you make the time because rushing through it, it's, it's not gonna work very well. Uh, don't be tempted to fill in all silences with words. Sometimes human beings get very uncomfortable when there's just two of us and there's silence and no one's talking. Let silence happen for a while before you chime in and give that person a chance to think and don't make them feel rushed. Right? If you start filling in all the silences, again, they're gonna probably start doing the same thing and, and the, you're just speeding up the pace of the interaction. That really works against your, your purposes. Sometimes even just counting to five or to 10 can be a great way for yourself to slow yourself down. So think about that. Looking, the value of eye contact. Eye contact tells us that someone is paying attention to us. What a, at a very minimum, they're paying attention to us. And there's all kinds of reasons to do that in a conflict de-escalation situation. The most positive reason to look at another person is to let them know you have my attention. I am paying attention to you, I'm listening to you, I'm hearing you, and I'm, I'm here for you. I'm not gonna ignore you. So that satisfies that recognition need in a very microscopic sense. The other value in looking is that if dangerous things are about to happen, you wanna have your eyes on the object of that danger by all means. So for your own self-protection, Look is also equally important. Continue paying attention to their nonverbal cues, their facial expressions, their motions, where their hands are, things like that. Uh, and maintain a neutral expression and smile when it's appropriate. But don't frown or shake your head or be judgmental. Just keep focused on them. Very important. And if you don't stare and make it uncomfortable, but keep a reasonable amount of eye contact to let them know I'm paying attention to you. That can have a very positive effect. The I in low line is to incline. Uh, not a, shaking the head a little bit to the side or tilting it a little bit to the side is an indicator of uh, in, interest in what the other person's saying. Like, hmm, never really thought of that before. That motion is a cue to the other person that I'm being listened to. So in the example here we see in the slide of the dog, we all think that's kind of funny when they do that. 
uh, it, it's true that they, they really are doing that, in, in their case, to sort of triangulate on the, the location of a sound source, like of a, an animal or something like that. But they are listening. It truly is a, a something that people do when they listen carefully or listen intently. So that's a good thing to show, to indicate non-verbally that I'm listening carefully to you. Nodding in agreement. This is a type of what we call back-channel communication. While you're speaking, you know what? I can be communicating with you. That's true, with, and, and then without interrupting. I don't have to say a word. I can, I can smile, or I could. Those are, I'm sending messages while you're talking. I might nod as you, you know, say something I'm agreeing with, and I might shake my head like in, like you say, yeah, the person never showed up and just left me there the whole time, and I might frown and go, just sort of showing that I, I empathize, I understand, like what a terrible thing that person did. So you can use head movements like you would in normal human conversation to let that person know that you're processing and you're agreeing with them as appropriate with the uh, utterances that they're making without actually interrupting them, without even talking while they're talking. And then part of the low line technique is also to express Continue using active listening skills to express empathy and a desire to understand. We do want to participate in the conversation when we're trying to de-escalate. So I can see how that made you feel offended, or I understand that that made things worse for you, or I can see why you feel that way. These kinds of comments are essentially letting the other person know that the receiver of their communication is getting it, is understanding it. And at a minimum, that's what people are looking for. They want to feel understood. So our goal in conflict de-escalation is to try to help that person feel understood so they don't resort to something much more drastic that actually is not gonna help them at all, but they, they might think, well, that's the only thing I have left to do. It's like, no, there's other ways. And you, you start by getting your, your thoughts, your feelings, your meaning, through to someone else, and that can be me. I can hear what you're saying, and I can understand you. So I'll paraphrase back to show that I agree and that what I'm hearing you say, and I empathize with what you're saying. Might even summarize, so it seems like this is what's going on here. Do I have that right? That kind of thing. That's part of the expressing that we do when we're de-escalating. Here are some tips on body language and verbal communication, um, things like being, uh, having a relaxed stance, uh, keeping your hands down and open and visible at all times. A upward turned palm is a non-threatening position to be in. Hands behind the back where you can't see what I got going on here, that's a potentially dangerous thing. So don't send any signs of danger. Hands down, and, and, or hands up like this, <laughs> I'm ready to duke it out. That's not good either. So obviously, you know, an open hand, a hand in a visible area down at your side is a, a very non-threatening position. So you want to have that non-threatening stance. Slow and deliberate movements, maintaining a, a neutral or attentive facial expression. Uh, in terms of verbal communication, saying things like, I can see that you are upset, or I want to help, what can I do? These kinds of offerings. And instead of making like demands like calm down <laughs> or, or I know how you feel, you know, you want to present yourself in a way that's uh, not confrontational, not judgmental, not overly confident either. Um, work with them and that can often bring down the tone of the interaction. Here are some other things to avoid. These are a collection of human communication behaviors that are just uh, downright toxic in a lot of conflict situations. So it's good to review these. We don't want to order um, or provide warnings. If you do this, something bad's going to happen. That just gets human emotions up. Um, moralizing or arguing. Remember, we've given up on arguing. Arguing is behind us now. There's a time in human interaction where you want to make a point. And there's another time in human interaction where you want to get along. This is the time when you want to get along. But making a point, save that for some other day. Judging, name calling, analyzing, um, probing, sarcasm, belittling. The last one, why? Use why questions very, very judiciously when you ask somebody, like, why did you do that? Generally, I would say, don't do that. Avoid asking why questions. If you do, you might say, why do you think so-and-so did that to you? 
that might be okay, because you might solicit their attribution for why they're in the situation they're in. But don't ask them, well, why did you, you know, swear at that person or call them a name? Why questions have a kind of implication to them that you did something wrong and I need you to now explain it to me? Again, this is not the time for that. So try to avoid why questions altogether if you can, or at least keep them isolated to the why do you think someone did that to you or why would someone treat you that way? That's okay because that can be diagnostic for getting their attribution about somebody else's actions. And that might give you some ideas for how you can de-escalate. Well, I know so-and-so. I could maybe talk to them about that. What would you think of that? Some do's and don'ts in conflict de-escalation techniques, just to, in closing, leave you with some thoughts. One, intervene early. The further the person gets up that arc of conflict, the more difficult it's gonna to be to bring them down. It's like climbing a tree. If you get all the way to the top of the tree, it's gonna be a lot more work to climb down. If you can get them to stop climbing, when they're six or seven feet off the ground, it's gonna be a lot easier to bring them back down. Very important point. Show genuine concern for the person and do so in a non-authoritative manner. You gotta be non-threatening and caring. You gotta come across as caring. Speak in a calm and gentle voice. Be aware of your own body. Remember, you can't control what they say or do but you can control what you say or do. So start with that and hope that in so doing, they will start to see you as non-threatening, an ally, someone who's not getting in the way, and someone who's probably more help than hindrance. If you can pull that off, you can have success in conflict de-escalation. Things to avoid, which could be like dumping gasoline on a fire or just not putting it out at all, being passive or indifferent, Conflict de-escalation is a very, very active process. So if you're, going to be, if you're feeling passive or you want to be indifferent, you're not going to be in a good position to enact these techniques. Avoid touching or coming too close to the person. This is sort of an American cultural thing. We tend to have a, a, a buffer zone that is pretty much equivalent to an arm's length. So if you can't reach out and touch me, I feel comfortable. But if you get within a zone, that's less than the length of your arm, then I know physical contact is a, prob is a possibility that usually causes people to feel threatened and back off. So keep a reasonable distance from the person. Don't show anger or take offense. They may be saying things that are making you very angry. They may be bad-mouthing you or people who you care for very much. This is not the time to let that get under control. You gotta manage your own anger and your own emotions and do not make judgmental comments. This is not a time to judge people or let them know what they're doing right or wrong in life. If you follow these techniques, these low-line tactics, and you use them repeatedly and you, and you practice with them in different conflict situations, you can get pretty good at managing what are potentially explosive situations from getting to the point where they're really out of control. But they involve this fundamental decision that you make in your mind that I'm not gonna argue with this person, I'm not gonna try to make a point, I'm not gonna try to win this conflict. My goal is one simple thing, to turn this whole thing down, to settle this person down, calm this person down, so that we can all live to see another day. That's the ultimate victory in any com conflict interaction between two people. Let's all live to see another day and tomorrow is another day, and maybe when we're feeling differently, we've had a night, good night's sleep and whatnot, we can sit down and talk about this rationally. There are times where we just, that needs to be the goal. And if you follow some of these low-line tactics, this can be very effective for you. I wanna to say too, we have a companion video if you're interested in third-party conflict interventions. That is, when you see two other people having a conflict, and you wanna think about, should I try to get involved and stop this? We have a small companion video that comes along with this. Please check it out, probably on the same site where you found this one. And I thank you very much and urge you to be safe. Have a wonderful day.